What is up, fellas? Welcome back to Convos Over Cold Brew with me, your host, Emma Abrahamson. Today, we have my most highly requested guest of all time, Molly Seidel. The amount of DMs I've gotten to have Molly on the podcast is absolutely overwhelming. So ask and you shall receive. You know, if you send me a DM asking someone to come on the podcast, usually I can come through with it. So I did that. And Molly is on the podcast today. And it was such a fun episode. It was a long episode because you guys had so many questions for her. We're going to have to do another episode after this. But love Molly. This episode was really fun. So I hope you guys enjoy it. If you want to rock convos over cold brew, we have some merch available. Link is always in the show notes. It's on my website, emmaabrahamson.com. But we have sweatshirts and stickers available as per usual. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at convos over cold brew pod. If you want to be up to date on the latest episodes and submit listener questions for each episode. With that little bit of housekeeping, let's get straight into today's episode with Molly. Okay, Molly, my number one most requested guest of all time. I know a lot of listeners are going to be happy. I've I've already gotten so many DMs of people being like, oh my gosh, yes. So excited for this episode. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I'm so excited. Like, see, that's the thing is like, I listen to your podcast all the time and it's just my ADHD brain. Every time I try to schedule something out, it's just got like five other things have popped up. So I'm glad that this finally worked out. I'm sorry that I don't have a, I have a a cold brew matcha right now or iced matcha. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not keeping to the, the spirit of the pod. It's okay. I already finished my cold brew, so I have nothing in hand. So I'm just (laughs) running off of good vibes. I think that'll be enough for us. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure probably 99% of people that listen to this already know who you are, but, uh, to get started for the 1% that doesn't know who you are, do you want to give a little introduction to yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Molly Seidel. I'm an American distance runner. Um, I compete for Team USA and Puma. I was a bronze medalist in this summer's uh, or the Tokyo 2020 Olympics in the marathon. And I really enjoy running and doing things that are not running too, because I have more to my life than just that. Yeah, I can't think of anything right now that I actually do. (laughs) Can't that's what happens exercise. in a marathon yeah. well in a marathon build you have to be so focused on everything that it's like all of your other interests just like have to take a back seat so then after you finish the like race and you get like a week or two off you're like what are my hobbies like <laughs> what do I even like to do what have I, what have what I not the, done for the last six months what's the point of anything but yeah so now this has been nice if I've gotten a little bit more time this week to like do things that are not running that are yeah. also fun so what have you been doing then what have I been doing I like biking so I've kind of just been like tootling around Flagstaff the weather's been really nice I don't like when I cross train I don't want to have to like go hard I want to just like adventure around um what else have I been doing I actually just got a new place and so I've been being super domestic and trying to get that all in order. Like, no, I swear to God, I got home from Boston and it was so nice to be able to just be like, yes, I get to like organize my dishes now. Like I'm so old. <laughs> Cause you couldn't do that before you had to sit on the couch and rest. No, no, it was, we, I actually moved in the week before leaving for Boston. Oh, okay. That and makes sense then. on top of that, we had to get everything out of the other house and move it over. So okay. it was like, we literally just threw everything into the house and kind of went like, there's nothing like moving, moving your entire house, like right before a major marathon, you know, that's oh. like probably really good for the body. <laughs> so John was like literally mad at me. Like he had a sit down talk because like John is my, my, my coach is my roommate and he had a sit down talk with me. He was just like, I know you like this whole, like being super independent thing like not asking for help but like you can't move couches and (laughs) it's okay it all worked out the other house is great I'm actually I'm renting out the the place that I used to live um to uh like runners that come into town now so so if anybody listening to the pod needs a place to the person who's going to stay there in June just fell through so if anybody needs a place to stay in flag 
hit me up. Maybe not in my DMs because that's just going to be a mess. <laughs> Email Emma. She'll send it through to me. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll be the forward. Uh, actually, a lot of people have asked me because I went to Flagstaff in at the end of 2020 and I stayed in a house with Eric Avila. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Eric lived with me for a while. <laughs> yeah. So I stayed with him for a little while. And then since then, people have DM me multiple times asking for places to live in Flagstaff. I'm like, I don't it's- know. There's nowhere. There's nowhere. It's actually crazy. So that's why I'm I'm renting out to New Balance because they couldn't find another second house. And so it's like, it is just kind of wild how much the city has grown from when I first started coming out here. I want to believe, or I think the first time I came out here was like 2013. Just seeing how much it's grown over the last nine years is insane. Just in like the general population? Because I know all the runners have moved there at this point, basically. I mean, general population, yes. I mean, there's a huge housing crisis. But um, yeah, in the number of runners that come out, like every national, like it's really fun right now because everybody's out here. I mean, heck, I was just up on uh, on the Mesa or going around Buffalo Park. And um, who is it? I saw Ella Donahue and Sinclair. I was just like, whoa, when did you yeah. guys get here? Like, so it is really fun if you're constantly having people coming in and out. Um, some of the like the old old guard get like grumpy of just like Mara Flags Jeff is played out. And I'm like, I don't know. I personally think it's fun to have a lot of people to run with. I think like that's why people go to Flagstaff because is because everyone's there and then everyone has yeah. like people to train with. Eric asked me this month again because he rented out the same house. He's like, Do you want to come to Flagstaff for a month? And I was like, I have absolutely no reason to come to Flagstaff at this moment other than hanging out with my friends. I said no, but now I have FOMO because all my friends are there, like Sinclair's there. My friend I mean, Kate is there. Everyone's staying in that house. And I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I should have come through. But are they at the one? I think I'm actually right by their house right now. Really? Because so, I think they're like adjacent to the track kind of. And oh wait, so, yeah, I see a track in the in the backyard. So you yeah. probably are like right by the house that I was staying at, I'm sure. Yeah, it's because they're right by Flag High. Yeah. And so I go to this kickstand coffee shop all the time. And so okay, it's like they're yeah. literally right there. Yeah. I mean, you should come out. It's Flagstaff, I'm a little bit biased, but it is so much fun. Like I know, I really want to. Like I, I asked Sinclair how long she was going to be there for, and it's like through May or something. So maybe I will come out because I want to see everyone. Everyone is there now, and I have FOMO, and I, I mean, I'm not really training for anything, so I have no reason to be there for altitude purposes. But for yeah. vibes, hey, there's stuff to do other than not everybody in this city runs, my dear. There's other <laughs> okay, okay, I know. <laughs> well, everyone I know running. runs. We'll go off-roading in my car. It'll be fun. Okay. You can go on hikes. Um, That's true. I don't know what, you can go to breweries. Yeah. We have a plethora of coffee shops. It's lovely. You can just hang. Okay. Well, now I'm having major. I should just come for, May, for April. Oh, well. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. There's Girl, always it, more time to My come. dear, April is almost over. Come I know. <laughs> I know. I know. So now I'll have to plan for May. I'll figure it out. Um... Okay, well, I kind of want to get into your background a little bit. We can okay. talk like a little bit about running, and then I just got so many questions, like hundreds and hundreds of questions, not about running, obviously, but we have to start with the running first because I'm curious more than anyone else. <laughs> because probably. this is a running podcast. Yeah, because it is a running podcast, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, so the first time I actually ever heard of you was at Foot Locker because it's here in San Diego. I grew up in San Diego. That's where I live now. But um, you won Foot Locker, so... <laughs> How was like your high school experience? Like, were you always that good or was it kind of like, whoa, I won Foot Locker? Yeah, no. So I, I was like a pretty good runner from kind of the get go. Like I knew this was something that I really enjoyed and I was really good at. So it's always nice when like (laughs) you can get both of those things for something. Um, but it was very small, like within just the state of Wisconsin, we weren't allowed to leave the state to compete. And because I was ski racing through high school, I actually didn't do foot locker until my junior year. I got 11th at regionals my junior year. So like missed out by one spot. And so like the next year I was just like, okay, I'm all in, like we're making it to nationals. And I think I could, I could win this thing just because like, I knew that my times were good. I wasn't like, I wasn't like a hyper competitive person. Uh, I, that's never really been like my shtick, but like, I, I knew I was like, Hey, I think I can definitely do this. And so, yeah, it was, pretty cool getting to it was a really eye-opening experience of doing that first Foot Locker Nationals my senior year and winning it and just being like oh like this is what running at the next level is because I don't think I really even comprehended it like I wanted to run in college but I didn't have an idea of what like 
very like elite running could be. So it was yeah. cool. So I, I did that. And then I got to race Edinburgh, which was my first team USA event. Um, it was a small one, but it was very just like, oh, this is what I want to do like forever. <laughs> it's so funny mm-hmm. how you're like, you didn't know what elite running was like, and then you won foot locker. Like, yeah. what? Well, like- no, but that's the thing is I don't come from like a running family. And yeah. so we didn't really have a frame of reference with it. And I was like, basically other than my siblings we were really the only ones in our school that ran so like I just didn't get how big it was like I had running heroes and like I knew like okay like I I I consciously knew these things were real but it didn't really sink in that this was something that I could do with my life yeah so then Mm -hmm. you went to Notre Dame for college how did you Mm -hmm. pick Notre Dame uh (laughs) coming from the midwest Notre Dame is kind of like our Harvard, like, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, everybody just drinks the Kool-Aid. My mom went to St. Mary's. So I've been going to Notre Dame, Notre Dame games since I was a kid. And so I looked at a bunch of other schools, but it just, it really made sense of ND one. My mom was pushing it pretty hard, but two, just, I really liked the girls. I liked that it was within drivable distance of where I grew up. It was like four and four hours or so. And just kind of fit with like the kind of person that I wanted to be. So yeah. I really enjoyed my time there. The weather was absolutely terrible, but I think it really like built my character. Aren't you used to that though? Like living in Wisconsin, like isn't the weather just bad? The weather is just bad all the time, <laughs> but like specifically winter, winters are just so hard. I don't know what it is though. I feel like I've gotten worse with it. Like I was- Well, when so you leave, I feel I like- leaving. I feel like when you leave for somewhere that's nicer, you just, you become a little bit wimpier. Don't you think? Yeah, I don't, what my theory though is like, I just don't handle the cold well anymore. Like I, I don't mind running in snow. I actually quite enjoy it. I throw on like Catula ice spikes or something and we'll run in the snow. And I go back to Wisconsin enough and flag has winter, but something about like in the Tokyo build, we did so much heat training specifically. Like I would wear like, multiple layers of cotton and we were just training in so much heat Ew. it's like it broke me I can't run in the cold anymore it was nice out today and I'm in a long sleeve shirt and tights like I don't know what happened to me <laughs> that's so funny you train for Tokyo and it ends up like ruining your ability to train in anything that's remotely cold at all <laughs> this is my theory though is I think I think you're better served like always training for the heat though. One, you always see Kenyans in a million layers of everything. Mm -hmm. Two, no one ever got to a race and was like, damn, I really wish I'd trained in the cold a lot more. It's like, no, you're all like, you need to get ready for heat. The heat's going to affect you more. So I just figured that's just the, I'm going to die on this hill at this point. Yeah. Honestly, you should like, and confidence is key. So as long as you believe that, like it's true, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just all we have is our own beliefs here. So if I can, if I just convince myself like, (laughs) oh yeah, it's objectively better to run in like just being sweltering all the time. Like I'll, I'll figure out my own logic for it. Yeah. And I feel like most marathons, they're not, they don't end up being freezing either. Do they? Like, has there really been a marathon that's like freezing except for Boston that one year when it was like sleeping. So I actually when I ran London in 2020 during the pandemic that one was really cold it was just like I want to say it was like 35 degrees like sideways rain it was really miserable um but that's the thing is like if, when you're running you warm up yeah. so it's like you have to be more heat adapted than cold adapted I think yeah it's a lot easier to um warm up then cool off while you're running Mm -hmm. so that makes exactly yeah you definitely have an advantage there so Mm -hmm. so you were like you were a 10k ish runner in college Mm -hmm. and then you you just went straight for the marathon it seems like pretty much (laughs) like did you did you race at all um you know track Uh races and stuff like as a pro pretty much before oh yeah I had a I had a a short not even that short I mean I guess it was four how many years four years of it um so yeah it's I I went pro with Saucony right after school and I focused on the 10k but I just I'm just not great at track at the professional <laughs> level it's it's a different beast that's the thing is like in college I feel like I could just like aerobically muscle my way through most races like even with a 3k like 
I'm kicking from about a mile out, <laughs> but it's like with that is, I feel like I could get by. Whereas then when I made the jump to track it or at the professional level, it just wasn't really clicking and I kept getting hurt all the time. So I had to take a long period off after I had my hip surgery in 2018, the summer of 2018, the better part of a year of racing. And after that, it was just like, I kind of lost all desire to race track anyway. And just like, and every time I tried to build up for it, something would break. <laughs> so yeah, it kind of, honestly, the moving up to the marathon was just, a, we were trying to be like, okay, maybe if we do marathon training, I won't break. So I can try and make the team for the 10 K for 2020. So that's why we did the trials. Okay, we're, It was just like trying to enable my track fitness. And then along the way, I figured <laughs> out that I actually really like the marathon way more than the other stuff. It's so funny how you're, you're prioritizing the marathon training so that your body doesn't break. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how that's even possible, but obviously it worked. I, yeah. I don't know. It's different strokes for different folks. I feel like, like, I truly believe every person has like their one superpower. Like everybody's got their one thing. It can be highly specific. And mine is just being able to handle like ungodly amounts of mileage, like without <laughs> breaking. I don't do it fast but I can handle it. And so yeah. it's like, that's how I get my fitness and my confidence is just throw a lot of mileage and aerobic stuff at it and just see what shakes out. Yeah. So the, the Olympic trials was your first marathon, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then you just literally qualified to the Olympics. What was, <laughs> what was that? Uh, you know, crossing the finish line. You're like, um, I guess I made the Olympic team. What did you think? Yeah. Well, it was so crazy because it's like when you're in the race, you're just so like keyed in and really not thinking about it. So it really wasn't like occurring to me until those final like 800 meters of just like what was go about to happen <laughs> and what we had just done. Because I had been just like assuming they were right behind us and going to catch us. And I was like, well, at least I can say I led the race for a while. Yeah. And it wasn't until they like put the flag in my hand and like to come down through the finish that I was just like, oh my God, like this is actually happening. And so it's just kind of crazy because it's like, it's the kind of thing where it's like, I always believed that I could make the team and I just didn't think it would happen that quickly. It's like, it, it was just very shocking because it was very much of like, we went into that race, just like, we have no idea what to expect. I have no idea how my body's going to feel like, let's just try this out and use this as a learning experience. And it went <laughs> so above and beyond my expectations at the time. <laughs> that is, I can't even imagine like, yeah, you said that you knew that you could make it a team, but like, how did you know? I mean, I guess just from workouts and stuff, but you had never actually raced. A no, no, that was the thing. I know. I think like in a more like ethereal sense of, I didn't, think I could make the team at that trial okay, necessarily, yeah. mainly because I was out here in flag and I was seeing what everybody else was doing, what Sarah Hall was doing, what the NAZ ladies were doing. And I was terrified because I couldn't <laughs> manage half of what their workouts were. It was like, I could barely manage like six by mile on some days. And so it was like, I, I knew like, it's the kind of thing where like, I knew deep down, I'm like, okay, someday the marathon is going to be my event. And someday I know that I could like, I, I believe that I can be one of the best people at this event, but I definitely saw it as a much more like long-term thing. I was like, Hey, like I want to go and I want this to be my career. So I'm willing to work at this over time yeah. and I don't expect it to all happen at once. And then it was like, boom it all happened at once <laughs> so what do you think like was the key to success for you I mean like you said everyone is doing these insane workouts but then you show up on the day and you're the one that makes the team like why do you think that happened um I think part of it was almost like you know how in like mindfulness practice or whatnot we'll get real hippy dippy they talk about like a beginner's mindset of just like approaching something like as as if you've never seen it before and it just like taking it very objectively. Yeah. And I think having never done a marathon really helped me at the trials because it was such a, having now done a couple other marathons and I've talked with John about this, the trials was objectively insane. It was so <laughs> hilly. Oh my it gosh. Was just, it was crazy. It was insane compared to any other marathon that I've run. And so all of these like champion marathoners from the U S 
came into this expecting like, okay, a normal marathon. And it was not like that. It was literally like they put a cross country course on the roads of Atlanta. And with it being the only one that I've ever done, like I wasn't crazy, crazy fit, but I was in very good shape. I'm very good at tactical races. I'm a great racer and I really like hills. And so I had no idea what to expect. I felt so bad that I was just like, oh, this is how you're supposed to feel in a marathon. And everyone else is like, no, this is not how you're supposed to feel in a marathon. And so I think I was able to just let it be what it was. And I don't know, that day was like a war of attrition, honestly. Like, it's just so crazy to think back. It was insane in so many different ways. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) then you went to the Olympics and you won a medal. That that was probably just (laughs) equally as insane, I'm sure, if not more. That, That one was crazy, too. It was like, maybe not, like, it was very, like, I don't want to say it was less surprising than the trials just just because like the trials came out of nowhere yeah. like based on my fit like the workouts going into that race I wouldn't like I couldn't have predicted that that one was like a black box that can't kind of came out of nowhere yeah with the Olympics I had been like like really feeling good really feeling confident and like I told my brother and sister when we talked the day before I was just like okay like if this plays out right like I know I could go for a medal at this but like it will take very specific conditions. And I think that's how it is with any race. It's like you prepare the best you can and then just like- Hopefully just the body it. works. <laughs> that's it. It's like, you never know what it's going to be on the day. And so it's like, it really is. It's like, you kind of just like put it out into the world and hope it's like, yeah, I could get a medal or I could be in 20th. Who knows? Like, yeah. we'll just see how it shakes out. Yeah. So then, I mean, you obviously ran really well. How was like the aftermath of that? Were you- I don't know. How, where do you even go from there? Like you qualified the Olympics with your first marathon, then you yeah. met all the Olympics. Then like, what, is, what are your thoughts now? Like, what do you do next? No, no. So I, I think I, I, I actually get that question a lot of, of like, I think this sport is really cool because there is always something to go for. Like no matter yeah. what you've achieved, there's always bigger, like more goals to go after. So like, it, it's been so cool that like the Olympics, uh, like all of that happened so early in my career. And it's really helped me gain a lot of confidence to race at the world level. But like, to be perfectly honest, I'm not at the world-class level of racing marathons yet in the, in the sense of times and how to race. And I think that kind of just showed like at Boston, I really still am very new at this and I feel like a rookie. And I haven't gotten a chance to race a lot of like fast marathons yet. And yeah, I think that's the exciting thing now is like, I feel like I'm almost using the medal less as like marking like the pinnacle of my career and more of just like, it shows me like, Hey, you have the stuff to make it at this level, but you have to work 10 times harder even now, because it's like, you can see what the top women in the world are running and like, what do you need to do to get there? Yeah. So what's like your main goal, I guess, for marathoning in general? I really like, I think a big thing for me is just like gaining strength, gaining speed and seeing what, like trying to honestly become like the best athlete I can be in the sense of like, I I've gotten my butt kicked by Paris Chefdegier at every single marathon I've raced with her. She's just, she walked away from me at New York. And I mean, I got my ass handed to me in Boston. And so it's just like, those guys are just on a different level than I am right now. Like I'm, I've run 224 in the marathon. They're 217 marathoners. And so a big, a really big goal for me is like, try and like normalize some of those faster times. Like, I think it's really cool what Kira and Sarah have done of running in like the two twenties. And I think that needs to become normal for American marathoning if we want to be competitive. So like, that's my biggest goal, honestly, is to just work on becoming a stronger, better marathoner and see what happens. What do you think that's going to take? Like, is it just years of consistency? Cause like you said, you're obviously very young and I mean, yeah, I feel like mar- when do women marathoners even peak in their thirties? I mean, most, I, cause I feel like most American marathoners don't start until they're 30. Yeah. And so that's where I think this is like kind of fun and exciting that we just have more time to work with. Um, knock on wood, like hoping to yeah. stay healthy, but it's like, 
that's what I see of just like, even like going into Boston this time, we were really using it as kind of a building marathon for worlds, but also just like, okay, like I'm hoping to get like a lot more Boston's in my career and what can we learn and grow over time. But I think that is it. It's just years and years and years of consistent work built up. Like I'm still really like the Olympic, like postponement was great because I got a full extra year to train and just seeing how much I was able to improve with just a year of steady training like that. I'm just like, man, like I can see how Sarah Hall can just absolutely crush every workout she does because it's just like, she's 10 years older than me. And it's just like with 10 years of just like consistent work, you just become an absolute monster. Yeah. So yeah, some of those like women marathoners, they, I can't even imagine what the last 10 years of their life has looked like to be able to get them as fit as they are. It's so insane. Like marathoning in general is so insane to me. I don't know how Ooh. any of you guys do it. Like being in pain for two and a half hours, that sounds so difficult. Um, and then the training that goes into that is even Ooh. more difficult. I, but that's the thing it really is, is just consistency more yeah. than anything. And that's why we try to not get too greedy and like the work that we're doing because for like a lot of time, like when I first switched to the marathon, kind of like leading into that first trials, I just physically could not handle the work. I'd had to take so much time off after my surgery. I just could not handle the type of intensity and volume that like, that is really necessary to be a very good marathoner. So it's yeah. like, that's why I kind of say sometimes that like the trials, I was really surprised because I just didn't have that background of work. And now like after that year of extra training going into the Olympics, it was just like crazy, like looking back, I'm just like, wow, the amount that I'm able to handle now versus a year ago is insane. And that's what I'm hoping that you just like, that you can just like kind of keep up that slow, steady progression to get where you need to be. Yeah. I mean, that's probably a big confidence booster though. Just already seeing that much progress in a year mm -hmm. <laughs> for you. Yeah. And, and it's fun. It's a, it's a little bit addictive of that. Yeah, I'm sure. And it, but it's cool to see. And I think it is like, I think sometimes like early in my career, I would get demoralized of just like, oh, like I'm not fast enough. These guys are running so fast. Like they're, they've got something that I don't have. And so I'm trying to switch that mindset of just being like, oh, like the human body is immensely changeable. And it's like, if you spend enough time and put enough hard work into something, you can change into anything you want to be. And so it's like, I'm trying to cultivate kind of that mindset of just like, okay, like I'm not that fast yet. Like I just got to keep working. Like, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a great attitude to have and it takes a while to get good at something, but like you said, consistency is key, yeah. but how do you like recover from, I mean, obviously Boston probably did not go as well as you would have liked. How do you, <laughs> Ayo. <laughs> um, but how do you recover from something like that? Like, obviously there's so much buildup into, you know, a world major marathon like that. And then also just having the pressure as like, mm -hmm. you know, top American distance runner, how do you recover from a race like that? Yeah. So it's, it's definitely tough. The one you have, your body is just trashed. I mean, I only ran 16 of that thing, but like my quads are so sore. And so like, honestly, this like last week was very, very easy. Um, especially with trying to just get my hip back feeling good. Um, and then even this week, it's kind of just like, giving your body the physical rest. Cause I mean, it's, it's 12 to 15 weeks of really intense training leading into a marathon and you're just exhausted after like not, even notwithstanding of like what the race does to you, your body's just trashed. So I'm, I'm trying to like, especially these last two weeks, like if, uh, oh, what is that? Um, <laughs> sorry, someone was just calling me. Um, but yeah, these last two weeks, it's like, if I've, if I'm really sore, I'm really not feeling good. I'm just like, okay, I'll like, I either just won't run today or I'll cross train or something, just do something fun, but just kind of as my body needs, honestly, after Boston, it's been more of a mental toll too. And so kind of just giving myself that space to just like, okay, like if I'm bummed out, I don't need to do anything or just like some days I run four miles, some days I run 13 miles. It's just kind of like whatever I'm feeling on that day and just yeah. letting it be what it needs to be until I feel like I'm finally like back and feeling fresh. Cause it will be a quick turnaround to worlds. Yeah. How do you handle like just having all that pressure on you though? Like obviously you kind of blew up, I would say after mm -hmm. uh, the trials and the Olympics and everything, and you became <laughs> You became yeah. like America's like star 
distance runner just kind of overnight I guess so how has that been for you I mean I think it, it's, it's obviously like you're fast running but then it's also your personality too but yeah how has it been you know being shoved into the limelight it's it's been honestly that's been one of the toughest things to manage and to figure out just because it is like I went for a long period of time of like yeah like you just you kind of train in isolation like you get I'm as surprising it is, is as it is to some people I am actually a very introverted person and so it's uh like I'm outgoing but I'm very introverted and so it's it can be really really exhausting a lot of the times to feel like you have to be constantly on and constantly like projecting this image and being what people need you to be and expect you to be kind of as weird as that sounds so I think it's been learning how to manage that side that comes with this because it's like it's a cool problem to have it's cool to be recognized and seen as like one of the top American distance runners and like to like that people are excited about it but it also is really a lot when like I can't leave my hotel room in Boston because I'm getting swarmed and stuff and so it's like it's a it's some baggage that comes with it but honestly it really is just like finding the line that I need to set of just like where my personal privacy is and I think I'm getting better with that just because it's like my whole life is like in the public sphere now yeah I get that I mean I I feel like it's kind of hard to separate that though it's like if you are an open person and you want to share your life it's hard to you know have that boundary of what you don't share and what you do share Mm -hmm. and everything but it's also hard for someone like you who's like you're in such a spotlight where even on like your worst days, you can't really hide it because it's just projected to the public. And then you have everyone commenting on it and everything. How do you like handle that? Like, do you have people to talk to? Do you just like not look at, you know, online stuff or Um, no, I need to be better. So I've been trying to back off of like, not like I, I get the terrible, like problem of loving to read like the worst comments about myself well I feel like everyone does you want to see you want to see what people are saying even if you know it's going to be bad you're just like let me just take a peek yeah it's just like I'll just take a quick little look (laughs) um but yeah it's it's learning to be able to like disassociate a little bit from that on both sides of it too not only the negative stuff but sometimes with like the overwhelming like obsessiveness that sometimes people get like I think that's the thing that's shocked me the most is like a lot of times like it almost feels like at these major marathons like if I need to like go meet people they only know me from social media and so they don't actually know me but they think they know me and so it's like it's this weird dichotomy of it of like they know a version of me but that isn't necessarily always how I am. I'm not always the outgoing, very happy Molly. Like there are days where I am just totally endo too. And I don't really want to talk to people, Yeah. but you can't be a bitch. Like when somebody comes up and it's like, my daughter loves following you. And I'm just like, oh, like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm having a bad day. I'm so sorry having a bad day like I really want to be nice but I also just want to go shut myself in a room like after Boston I honestly like like I got back to my my house here in flag and I kind of like shut myself up in the house for like two days because there was just so much overstimulation over the course of Boston even like like even with like with the race going going badly and like already like mentally struggling with that and just being like yeah feeling just so like it was just so much yeah I man I just can't even imagine like going to a race like that in your position and then just not having the day that you wanted and then just Mm -hmm. everyone swarming you oh my oh my goodness yeah it also makes me yeah Uh, It also makes me think about people that like have, I don't know, have millions of followers or they're just like super famous and every day they're really famous people actually do it because that's like, that's the thing that's nice is like, I, it's like a minimal amount of celebrity for very specific conditions. It's like only amongst runners and only on like very big, like running event centered weekends. Yeah. So in 99.9% of my life, it's totally fine. It's just always happens to be like this crush of stuff when I'm already under an inordinate or inordinate amount of stress getting ready for a major race where it's like, okay, I'm already like overstimulated now with like so much, like 
media and people coming in and I've also got a, like a huge marathon in two days yeah exactly there's I can't I literally can't even imagine what it's like to be in your position but I mean I think you handle it well you obviously have a good head on your shoulders and I've, I've got a really good team that like John has been super helpful with it um my my agents over at Total Sports they help manage like keep everything straight because I cannot keep everything straight at this point and like my family is just super supportive with it so yeah it's I think a lot of it is is just like surrounding yourself with the people that you know are like in your corner regardless yeah because at the end of the day it's like people who only know you off of social it's very changeable it's like one minute you're up one minute you're down you can't really like base your confidence off of that and so it's like just knowing that you're surrounded by people who like have to be there for you whether or not it goes well it is like really nice yeah oh that's so true I mean it's I can't I mean I'm glad that you have like you know your coach and agency and everything because I mean I feel like that's why professional athletes have those people for just like the support system more than anything else so exactly and and it's like it's so difficult it's certain like we're trying to uh we're trying to do a very specific thing of like racing going. And so it doesn't necessarily come naturally to, at least to me, to be able to balance all of these other obligations. So it's like my, my agent is on literally speed dial just because it's like the number of times where it's just like last minute things that like come up that I have to do, or like that I've forgotten about usually is, uh, it's, yeah, I feel like I talk to him probably more than I talk to John at this point. <laughs> Family. It looks a little different for everyone. For some, it's mom and dad. For others, roommates who feel like family. And for others, it's your significant other, their golfing buddies, your children, a high school soccer team starting lineup, and oh look, they're all taking you up on the offer to stay for dinner, really testing the limits of that phrase, the more the merrier. But no matter where you call home, GEICO makes it easy to bundle and save on home and car insurance. Easier than making three frozen pizzas and assorted frozen veggies into a cohesive meal. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. So what's like the most like surprising thing that comes of being famous in the running world? Like what, what, I guess what's changed is the amount of probably media requests that you get. Honestly, the amount of media requests, the amount of podcast requests. Um, Yeah, I can't even imagine. But uh, yeah, I think it's funny. Actually, Jack, this is the crap about this. People just send things all the time. Like Like in the mail? Like in the mail, like pro, like random products or whatnot. Um, like people will find my address. I don't know how, and just like ship things. I got a giant jar of Marmite one time because I said I liked Marmite. Um, (laughs) and yeah, what is it? Uh, and then this weird thing has been happening. I don't know what it is, but I'll get like fan mail from Germany and it's always the same thing. It's a, a letter and inside are like three to four printed out photos of myself. And then they've, put like a pre-stamped like envelope in there and they're like please sign them and send them back to me in Germany I honestly get like one a week and I don't know if this is the same man just using different aliases to get a million different photographs or if there really are just a lot of people in Germany that have are willing to print out photos of me to send them out and back I also don't know how they're getting my address yeah I'm like that's the creepiest part of it is how they're getting your actual home address yeah. So I guess that's the thing is like, in my mind, like, especially even before this, I still quite don't understand all of this, but it's just like, I'm like, okay, running's a very small sport. Like people really don't care about it, but then it's like, oh, actually people really do care about this. And so it's yeah. like, yeah. So it's kind of cool in a way to be like, oh, wow. Like, it's like, I mean, this is like kind of fun and like interesting, but it's also just like, okay. Uh, like, odd <laughs> <laughs> I mean the run, running is so small but then it's also I feel like it has the most like diehard fans out there because yeah. it is like a lifestyle mm-hmm. when you, I know when you like follow other sports it's like you're not actually like, playing soccer most of the time when you're yeah. following it as like an adult so yeah. I feel like running is just different because you have such a tie to it 
Does yeah, it's like why? it becomes your entire personality. Yeah. I guess that's what I have realized going to these major marathons is just like, wow, like it is just so much just because like the majority of my marathon career was during a pandemic. So between like, like for a solid year and a half, I was only doing races that were totally in isolation and now being thrown back into like what actual major marathons are. I'm like, this is enormous. There are like, people are so passionate about this and that's so cool, but it's like, it's like, wow, this is like a deep, really intense thing that yeah. hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people do. I mean, it's so different than elite track racing too. It's just so, cause I, I've run one marathon. I ran Chicago in 2019 and I was so overwhelmed with the amount of people there and the amount of people that were running 26 miles. I was like, mm-hmm. how is everyone doing this? Like I have yep. an elite competitive running background and I'm, I'm going to finish this marathon. I don't know how it's going to go, but how is every other person around here also doing that when most likely they're not an elite runner? So but that's, I think that's honestly the coolest thing about the sport is just like that there is so much participation from people from all walks of life that you don't need to have run in college or in high school to be a runner. You can come into it totally independently. And like, I don't know, that's what makes it so fun. And that's what I really do appreciate when I go to these races. Like it can be so overwhelming to just be like, like swarmed by people or whatnot. But what I really do enjoy is actually like getting to have a conversation with someone and like figure out like what they're running, what their goals are, like what kind of drives them. Like it can be a little bit like dehumanizing and just be like, Oh, snap a selfie back, go. I would much rather like actually talk to the person because I think everybody who runs is like, they've got a fascinating story with how they came into it. And like, yeah. yeah. Especially so, yeah, everyone that's all running. The, all the listeners, I'd rather talk to you than take a selfie. If you mean, <laughs> just please. forewarning. Now you're just going to have lines of people waiting for full on conversations with you. <laughs> you know, what? I would rather do that. I would rather spend two hours actually talking to people rather than just like two hours of just like, bam, selfie, bam, selfie, bam. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people probably do that also because they don't think that you want to have a conversation with them because there's 40 other people waiting for a picture, but. I mean, yes. it's nice to know that you want to have a conversation. And I mean, it, it is cool because someone that is not really an elite runner or hasn't been and dedicates their time to running 26.2 miles, like their story has to be super interesting because mm-hmm. who would do that? You know, a lot of people do uh, yeah. do that. Well, and so I think that's what's cool is just because like my experience is very specific. Like, yeah, yeah. it was like, like a runner in high school. I was very good, came to it and like kept like, you kind of like ride this momentum. Like if you're good in high school, it pushes you, then you're in college then you're a pro whatnot. Yeah. I like, I think it's so cool. Like people coming into this, like independently, like how they found it. Like it is a very, at its core, kind of a niche sport. Yeah. And so it's just like, okay, like how the hell did you figure out about that? Like figure out that this was like a thing. Did you watch a marathon? And you got excited or what? Like, that's what I find cool. Yeah. It's so much more interesting than the, I mean, the route that you and I and all the other elite runners have taken pretty much. I mean, you have that yeah. rare person here and there who gets into it super late, like in college or something, but yeah. And marathoning might be different too, but like in terms of track racing, everyone just has that same like path mm-hmm. of being good in high school and track, then, you know, end yeah. up marathoning or whatever, but yeah, marathons, I mean, they're super interesting. So, and yeah. I need to interview more people that are like in the marathon world because I, I find their stories a lot more, um, exciting. Not that, I mean, I like talking to elite runners too, obviously. Cause yeah. I have. Yeah. I think it's like, I don't think I realize just how separate of sports yeah. they are. They're hard. Like marathon is a different sport than elite track. And yeah. so it's like, and every time I go down to Sedona track on a Friday <laughs> night, I am constantly reminded of that where I'm just surrounded by like the best track runners in the world. I'm just like, we are in different spheres but that's what I think it is cool that it's like yes we technically are all lumped under the same thing but it's just such different approaches to it yeah so I guess they must have solved the poop issue in Sedona right yes (laughs) poop gate that was an absolute disaster but yes luckily we are allowed back on Sedona track everybody is following the rules they better be um and so we will not make the high school mad at us because that is literally the most critical track in the country for u.s distance running at the moment for those um that don't know what happened didn't people someone just like pooped on the track right 
I will have to, outside the I will have to um, plead no comment on this one on account okay. that I already got in trouble for tweeting about it. So what? Okay. Well, maybe we don't need to talk about it. Yeah. This. Yeah. Let's just say um, some individuals behaved reprehensibly and got us kicked off of the Sedona track. And yeah, the, um, the United coaches of Flagstaff had to all work really hard to be able to get us back on. And so there are so many different teams out here, so many different people that it's like, there is now a reservation system. Hopefully everybody's following along the rules. You cannot go on during school hours. You can't, it's just, yeah. Wow. I'm hoping everyone follows the rules because it's a very, it's a great track. They are so nice to let us on there. They are constantly getting swarmed by runners who are not always super respectful of like, of the fact that it is a functioning high school. So yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. We just need to not be entitled assholes <laughs> about it. <laughs> that track is beautiful too. I went there when it's, I was there in 2020 or whatever, but it, it's such a gorgeous track too. Ooh. Sedona is just beautiful in general. I mean, I love going to Sedona. It's like, I go down there quite a bit because it's super fun to camp. It's a great town. It's, it's pretty touristy in like the center of it, yeah. but like you go out a little ways and there's so many cool areas to just like run or hike or, or, or mountain bike or whatnot. So it's like, I don't know. I love that. It's just 45 minutes from flag. Yeah. And it's like a fun little trek down from Flagstaff too. And everyone's like getting mm-hmm. ready for the workout. Then on the way back, yeah. you pick up food or you just like eat a good meal and then you head back and everyone just mm-hmm. camps out on the couch. It's a fun See, little Honestly, mall. those are like some of my favorite days where it's yeah. just like, yeah, you get a ton of people down there. It's a very social thing. It's really fun. You all go grab dinner afterwards. And it's just like, I don't know. Those are my, some of my favorite days. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, again, I don't want to keep you on for too long because you, I don't literally, know, fun. I'm, I'm down to hang for a bit. I'm okay. Because we have quite a few uh, questions to go through. Obviously we're not going to go through 300, whatever questions I got. Um, are you serious? That's how many you got. There were so many. I've never gotten so many questions and I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to pick from these, but I picked oh my um, God. some of the good ones. So here we go. Perfect. Someone just asked, do you like beer? We already know the answer obviously, but like, what is your favorite beer? What is my favorite beer? Um, I contractually have to say Michelob Ultra. Actually, oh. I really do like Michelob. No, but actually, um, what is, I've been really vibing lately with, um, what is it? Omission IPA has been really, really good. Um, I've been having like some digestive problems. So I've been trying to like be a little bit better about like the amount of gluten that I'm having, like when I'm like really heavy training. Um, so yeah, that's kind of nice to like seed in there. Um, but yeah, honestly, I love just like, I love going to places and seeing whatever their like local specialty is. So like when I'm on the East coast, like hazy new England, IPA, Wisconsin is going to be some sort of Pilsner or Amber. Um, but I feel like West coast, you get like the, like really like dank IPAs, whatnot. So I think that's, what's fun is just seeing like the regionality of beer. I wish I liked IPAs. I, yeah. I've been to so many breweries in my life. I mean, I lived in Portland and then I live in San Diego. Now there's a ton of breweries around here. I don't mm. like IPAs. They're too much. It doesn't taste I good. Think, I think you've got to find the right ones. Cause mm-hmm. I didn't love IPAs until I moved to Boston. And then there's a great brewery called Lamplighter that we lived right by in Trillium that specialized in like hazy new England IPA. And that was like my gateway into it. Like I, and okay. so I really like it, but it's under a very specific set of like conditions. So I will say like, I love IPAs, but I can't drink them all the time and not like super heavy. Not like, I don't want to feel like I'm chewing on it. <laughs> big, I'm a big pills girl. I can crush a Pilsner anytime. Oh, Pilsners are so good. That's like oh. my go-to every time. I mean, it's boring, oh, but it's so good. so good. Hey, no, it's not boring. Like Pilsner, it's, it's the most like famous or what is it? It's the most common beer for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you like ciders and stuff or do you, I oh. love to see, like, I love ciders. I love fruity stuff. Ah. Uh, no, see, I, I don't really like fruity okay. stuff. Um, I'll have a cider if it's a really dry cider. Um, what is it? The hard kombuchas have been pretty good yeah. too. Um, what is it? I tried like a June shine or something. Yeah, June shine. They're actually headquartered here in San Diego. A lot of them are ha- actually headquartered here in San yeah. Diego. I guess it's very common, but yeah. Uh, but that's the thing is honestly, like I actually really do just like the taste of beer, like especially light beers. And so that's what like, I honestly would much rather have like a like a light beer rather than like something super fruity or whatnot like middle of summer there's <laughs> nothing better like get back from a run like 
ice cold beer just like oh so good okay do you think that there's a correlation between the amount of miles you run and like how much you like beer because yeah. when I was when I was training for my mm-hmm. first marathon the only marathon I've run I I've never liked beer in my life I'm definitely more of a cocktail person but when I started training for Chicago I started craving beer and I've never craved mm-hmm. beer in my entire life and I was like I just remember after like a long run, I don't even know. It was like 14 miles or something. And I had a beer later that day. It was like an ice cold Pilsner. And I was like, incredible, incredible. And so that's the thing is like after long run, specifically like in marathon training, like I really want beers like later in the day. Whereas like, it's kind of funny because I think more people would assume like, oh, you probably drink a ton of beer when you're out of season. I'm like, actually, I don't like, like right now I'm not really like craving it. Like everybody like went out the other night. I was just like, ah, like, I don't know. I don't really feel it. But then it's like, when I'm in really heavy training, like, oh my gosh, it's just like, it hits different. (laughs) It hits different. Like you will like, you cap off like 135 mile week. Like you long ran in the morning. You've got the afternoon off. Like I just want to camp out at a brewery and just like hang out. I feel like that is the best way to get back in carbs. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, I've never ran 135 miles a week, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'll channel that energy next time. Channel that kind of energy. Yeah. <laughs> See, it's, it's always, it's like, it's whatever level you're at, whenever you finish off and you're just like bone tired and your body just needs carbs. It's yeah. just like, yes, I just want the, I just want like, yeah, nice, nice ice cold beer. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to talk about dating because uh, the amount of questions I got about dating, oh, are God. you dating anyone? Or are you I don't want to have to fucking go over online dating or what. I don't know why this blows everyone's mind. Like maybe it's just because every other female pro distance runner is like happily married and like in stable relationships. I'm sorry. I'm a 27 <laughs> year old millennial woman. And so it's like, yeah, I don't know. I just, just I'm trying out here I'm trying trying. do you like try to date other runners or is it just kind of like you just whatever happens happens it's just whatever happens happens honestly I almost try to stay away from dating other pros um one because it's a very small world um two it's just all pro runners are psychotic I'm psychotic we all are we wouldn't be in the sport if we weren't that's just a lot of that's a lot of strong energy to have two pros yeah. like together in a relationship. It can be really tough. So like, honestly, it's kind of nice, like dating people that like understand the sport sometimes, but either aren't obsessed with it or just like, sometimes like even have no frame of reference for like what the sport is. Yeah. It's kind of, I feel like it's better that way. Cause then anytime you do anything like yeah, they're like, great job. Like you did so well. <laughs> You're like, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, well, okay. I've been on the dating apps for a little while, but how do you respond to someone asking you to race or asking you to like, go for a run as a date? Um, I think it depends the tone. Like you can generally tell the tone. Um, I feel like asking to go for a run is actually like pretty nice. Like sure like I'll do that it's kind of weird just because like running is my job of like you wouldn't normally just like if an accountant was just like hey let's like crunch numbers together it was like okay um so it's like uh, yeah it's finding like very specific set of conditions and if the person is like chill and cool about it that's fun but you can always tell when like the person like takes themselves way too seriously and that's the turnoff there and so that's the thing it's like if you can tell someone like really thinks they're like like hot stuff and that's generally where the like oh she like that's great like think you could beat me and so that's where it comes from whereas like if a person comes across as like self-effacing funny just like a cool kind person it's like sure like yeah let's go for a run and have beers afterwards yeah see okay I have a strong opinion with running dates though because I find Mm. that they gave me they like give me the biggest ick in the entire world kind of Mm. Um, yeah. because usually you'd like the person they're like let's go for a run and I'm like okay and I've done this multiple times and I don't know why I've, I've sworn it off now because I just can't anymore um, <laughs> yeah. because this is my feeling See, I've like, never actually gone on one so oh, like, I can't. it's actually good intel okay I don't recommend and this is like a controversial opinion on my platforms because people get mad at me for saying it but someone is always like better than the other person. So there's already a bad dynamic there because if you're, especially uh, first date, a first date, yeah. like this, this is the scenario I'm talking about. Like you've never met the person. You don't really know anything about them. Let's go for a run. Um, so 
like you're going to be way better than the other person, obviously, like right off the bat, unless they're another runner, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so the other person's going to be trying to keep up with you and like trying to like, you can't really, but the other person can't really talk because they're going to be out of breath, even like regardless of the pace that you're running, someone's always going to be way more tired than the other person. And then you finish the run. You're all sweaty and gross. And you're just meeting for the person, this person for the first time, they're like foaming at the mouth. (laughs) <laughs> and it, like everyone's just so sweaty and then it's like okay do you want to like go I mean you can go get beers after or something but then you're like sweating you kind of smell and it's just like it's not the vibe of a first honestly day. you're making a really good case on this one like I'm at, like because I guess I never even realized that like logistically just one yeah gross you're all sweating you want to like put your best foot forward on the first date and yeah two then you've got like the weird like dynamic of like okay who's better like is one person just like uncomfortable are you straining to keep up like man I this is actually like a really good heads up I should never do a running date I mean I think you should try it like you should try it at least once just to get the feel for it maybe not as like the first date yeah yeah don't do a first date I never recommend it as a first date it's just awkward it's not the vibe Like give it a few dates and then jump back into it. But yeah. Yeah. I have just, so I've, that's it. I've been seeing this guy who he does, um, he'll do like trail running and stuff, but yeah, like he didn't run in college and run in high school, came into it later. And honestly, I have to say like one of the best things. So we like, like met up and whatnot. And like, he came down to flag, but he went for a run at the same place that I was doing my run with my roommate, Danny. And he ended up linking up with us for like five minutes. And so his thing, he does like long stuff, but he likes to go like, like 8.30 to nine minute pace on a lot of his stuff. And so Danny and I were running. And so he like, we match up. He's running with us for like five minutes. It's just like, you guys are too fast. You guys just go on ahead. I'll meet up with you later. And honestly, that was probably like the, like, oh, like. That's like the a best man that can admit that a man that can admit that and just be like, Hey, you don't go do you will meet up later. Like we're going to each do our thing and just have fun doing it. I'm just like, that is so nice that he didn't feel like he had to like freaking like send it or impress anyone. He's just like, I just want to run my pace and go. So like, that's, what's kind of nice. Honestly, that's the best thing. I don't want to ever have to race anyone. <laughs> that is literally the best case scenario ever because you still get that little like, Oh, we're running. But then he puts his ego aside. Mm -hmm. and drops himself from the pack and then you guys can hang out later that is like actually so ideal i know snap snap for him i can't snap but pretend i am (laughs) um okay well someone asked why won't you get a dog why won't i get a dog because i travel so much right now that's the thing so people assume based on that video that i don't like dogs no i love dogs i grew up with dogs Of the three people in our house, I am the only one who has ever had dogs, raised dogs. We had eight puppies when I was 12 years old. I know dogs. I also know that dogs are so much work and I travel so much and everyone else in our house travels a lot. When I am in a stable life situation or have a long-term partner that can look after the dog when I'm traveling, I don't want to give that dog that kind of life. I don't want to have to kennel it. I don't want to have to leave it inside all day long. I respect dogs enough to know that I am not in a place in my life right now that I can have a dog. (laughs) We love a responsible queen. The amount of dogs that I've seen that have been like, not necessarily neglected, but just not given the life that they should be having because of Mm. these reasons is too many. So I respect that decision to not get a dog. And so that's the thing. I feel like a lot of people got dogs during the pandemic. Yeah. And then it's like, you go back to work and you have your normal life. And what do you do? You have to leave the dog at home all day long. And so it's like, I, where I grew up in Wisconsin, like we had, uh, like we had multiple labs and, but we had a lot of land so they could run around all day and like do stuff. And like, that's the thing is like, I want that kind of life for my dog. I don't want my dog stuck inside all day. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. What kind of dog would you want? Um, so it's either like, I love corgis, like love, love, love corgis. We actually had a corgi at the house this weekend. Cause a friend of mine is watching a corgi brought him over. Oh, love him. Mm, just yes. <laughs> um, either that or a lab. Cause I grew up with labs. I love labs. I love that they are, um, not the smartest dogs, but the most loving. Yeah. That's they're the a little thing. airheaded, but they're so sweet. Uh, that's the thing is like Winnie. So this is like our family's lab. She's 14 now. And she was like back home in Wisconsin with my parents. She is a couple, a couple bulbs short of a Christmas tree, but just the sweetest dog you will ever meet. 
I'm like, I love that. I don't need a dog that can like solve a Rubik's cube. I just want a dog that loves me. <laughs> I just want companionship from a pet. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question. Do you cut your own hair? No, my mom cuts my hair. <laughs> oh. Someone asked yeah. like, do, and then someone asked, would you get bangs? No. Oh my God. No. <laughs> and my forehead. No way. No way. I've had effectively the same like hairstyle since I was like in high school. There's, it, I can't do much with it, but uh, uh, you're not going to change it up. Yeah, no, I'm pretty simple because I just go with a straight cut generally. And I don't want to have to spend $60 going to a nice salon. Um, I probably should actually get something done with it. Um, Cause it's a little like ratty right now, but generally like my mom will cut both mine and my sister's hair. And so like in Boston, my, I was going to cut Izzy's hair for her um, <laughs> just because both of us, we just do a straight, like a straight cut. I'm very good at cutting hair. I've cut Rachel Schneider's hair, Rachel Smith. Um, I've cut my college roommate's hair. I've cut Izzy's hair. So like, it's not rocket science. It's not the greatest cut probably, but <laughs> I your friends come to you. You're like, please give me a haircut. You're like, it's not the greatest, but I will do it for you. Yeah, honestly. Uh, I've been really liking going to sports clips. The, okay. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah where like men are supposed to go I'm probably the only woman they've ever cut her hair but it's like it's easy I can pay them $20 and they do a great haircut yeah well maybe you can turn like your own little haircut business into a little side hustle my MBA I'll go to cosmetology school <laughs> yeah what what do you want to do after finishing running oh I don't know I feel like I'll cross that bridge when I come to it I, yeah I've always got like a million different things that I like to do at one time. I, I really struggle with like sitting still. And so I don't know, I, I honestly would love to go into the running industry. I, I'm very passionate about like running shoe design. Um, that's kind of part of getting this MBA is like, I would like to work for a running company someday, maybe Puma, who knows? Um, and so it's like, yeah, I, I think there's so many things that you can do afterwards like I don't know maybe like John and I will try and make Baird ATC like a bigger thing than it is or I'll start a professional marathoning group here in Flagstaff who the mm -hmm. hell knows yeah at the I time like right now I'm kind of just like yeah trying to learn as much as I can and like set myself up for like knowing there will be a life after running and just like I feel like I'm pretty smart. I'll figure out something. <laughs> yeah I'm sure you know what you're doing and also like if I were you I would not be worrying about that because you have 10 plus years of marathoning <laughs> to go. knock on wood yeah and that's the, like that's the exciting thing is just like hoping that I've got like a, yeah. a few more years left to this thing yeah um, but yeah it's just knowing like eventually the day will come where I won't run anymore and like there's so many things in life to do heck I could like I did archaeology in college like maybe I'll just do that oh <laughs> yeah. I was gonna ask it was so that was your major yeah so I was technically pre-med um but then like my how it works at Notre Dame you have like I uh, like arts and letters pre-professional so it's like you do pre-med but then you have to do like a, a a major like a liberal arts major and so I actually chose biological anthropology because it went with pre-med pretty well um but then ended up doing a lot of archaeology stuff wow that's very mm -hmm. interesting I don't think I've ever met anyone that's gone down that path so that's yeah no it was wild bad. I loved getting to do that I thought that was what I was going to do for a while when I like I was in college and I hated running and I was just like I'm gonna be an <laughs> I hated running. <laughs> and look at you now now you're running 100 whatever miles a week so I know that well that was it is I went to Argentina for a summer and just to deal with like the culture shock I would just run and I was running like 90 miles a week up at altitude in the Andes. And I was like, actually, I do kind of like running. And then Sparks came in the next year and just like the whole career changed. Yeah. <laughs> what is like your why? Like, why do you run? I just really like running. Honestly, that I've never been like, I've never been like competitively driven. It almost is just more of like, I really enjoy doing this. And like, I love getting to go out and run and I love getting to see how good at, like I could be. So I don't know. Yeah. Like it's never motivated me of just like, I want to be the best. It's more of just like, I just want to go out and see how hard I can, how hard I can go and like do this. And even though some days I just want to be in nature and just yeah. like run around. I mean, that's definitely a good key to longevity is to do it for fun, not for competitive mm -hmm. aspects. So yeah. Cause that's the thing, even after I'm done, like competitively running, 
and like if my body is still hold like holding up I'd love to keep like I'd keep running twice a day every day even if I like wasn't competing I just yeah. really like doing it yeah that's awesome um okay what is uh what is the best running city in the U.S. Austin come on Johnson is D.C. <laughs> I know that I, I knew that was a John question. John is trying to convince me that DC is the best running city. No. And I'm surrounded by all these Georgetown alums that are just drinking the DC Kool-Aid. No, Boston is by far a better running city. It's just how way more it, fun. How would DC be a good running city? Like what, where are I you running know. around there? Other than that I, one little trail by Georgetown. Well, the one like the towpath by Georgetown, and they're like, "Oh, you can run the monuments." I'm like, "I don't want to run the monuments. I don't want to run the monuments every day." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like Boston is incredible. You've got the Emerald Necklace. You've got the river. You can go down. Like if you want to run in the city, go down, run around the city, go to Jamaica Pond, go up to Cambridge. Or, yeah, Cambridge, north of the city. There's a million places to run, and so it's like, and it's got a great running culture. There's so many people running. There's great like team like aspect of it there are breweries to go to after you finish a run like I think it's the perfect running city it's so much fun so do you think it's better than flag no so flag I think is the best place to run in the country flag is not a, like city. Uh, yeah flag is a city Bo- like I would like a metropolitan like city cities, a metropolitan yeah. city so if we're trying to figure out like between like New York Boston Chicago Houston so, like those are cities flag is a town surrounded by the like more fire roads and trails than you could ever imagine. So like, yeah. yes, I will, I will preface. I like running in flag more than I like running in Boston because I, you don't have to deal with being in a city, but Boston is the best running city ever. Okay. Maybe I should travel to Boston again. I was there in 2019, but I only, I was like in Cambridge. So I only ran around on the river yeah. or whatever. I don't even remember where I was to be honest. Yeah. Anyone who says that you can't train Boston is, it just isn't trying hard enough. Like I trained <laughs> for marathons in Boston. It can be done. There you go. You just got to put your mind to it. Yeah. Um, what is the one thing that you pack for travel every time? That's like a little unusual. Do you have anything? <laughs> uh yeah actually a lot of times I'm trying to break myself of this habit um but a lot of times I will pack a full coffee pour over setup so <laughs> a pet, like okay no only because I've been done so dirty so many times of okay. like when you race very early in the morning coffee shops aren't always open yeah and so you have to make your own coffee and or just like I want I'm good at making coffee I I know what I, I like I know how to make it I want it how I want it so I will bring a plug-in metal kettle. It's about yay high, like maybe like five inches high. Um, I will bring my, my coffee beans, a coffee grinder and like a pour over setup or an AeroPress. So it's like, I am literally, this is, there's not many things that I am like crazy high maintenance about. Coffee is something that I am crazy high maintenance about. I brought that whole setup to Tokyo. I brought it, (laughs) like I bring it everywhere. I did not bring it to Boston just because I know like my coffee spots and what times they'll be open. Yeah. So you already knew the city. You didn't have to worry about it. So yeah. you say that you're like a coffee snob. What's your favorite coffee? I mean, you want a Dunkin' sponsorship, I've heard. Yes. I want a Dunkin' sponsorship. However, the, actually maybe I don't because then that <gasps> would limit on like what I can do because like, so I love like my favorite, favorite roaster of all time is Collectivo. They're based out of Milwaukee. Um, they were the first coffee, like the first coffee shop I ever worked at. They like sold Collectivo coffee. And so like, that is my go-to. Um, every time I'm back in Wisconsin, I pick up bags of the stuff. Um, I also really like here in Flagstaff, we have single speed, great coffee, literally the slowest service I've ever encountered. They're anywhere. single speed, slow, single, single speed. And that speed is slow great coffee though like there are micro roastery in town they're so good um who else I feel like like people will send me coffee bags from like different places or like it's a a a great gift for me because I'm gonna use it obviously so it's uh what is it there's soul brewed um out of Wisconsin as well in Boston I love just like there's so many different places it's kind of like with beer it's just you can get great coffee in so many places um where what's the one there's cartel there's one down in um phoenix that everybody's been going to it's not pavement that's the one in boston oh what is it press 
Press Coffee in Phoenix is incredible. There's just so many coffee shops. It's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But But that's the fun thing is you can try a million. And then I go up to Portland and there's, it's a freaking like, yeah, entire culture up there of coffee. So that's the fun thing is getting to go around and try out new spots. Have you ever been to Phil's? Is that the one where they do like only pour overs? Okay. I had a friend that worked at Phil's and she said that it was a terrible place to work. So I kind of avoid it based (gasps) on that. Don't tell me that Phil's is the best coffee ever. They have like literally, it's just, it's so different than everything else. So you can't get lattes or anything. It's only pour overs, but it's so good. But I'm sad that she hated working there, but yeah, you should try try it. It's so good. It's so good. If I see a Phil's, I'll try it out for you. Yeah. Have you had Blue Bottle at all? Okay, I love Blue Bottle. Bro, I've been going to Blue Bottle every day. I door dash it to my house, which is really bad. Uh, and it's like $15, but I'd get two two coffees for $15. I'm like, that's a little better. Yeah. Um, but I'm obsessed <laughs> with Blue Bottle. $7.50 a coffee. <laughs> okay, I live, in, okay. I live in Southern California, okay? It's expensive here. Okay, so I will say that the first time I ever tried Blue Bottle, so one of my friends in college, Michael Clevenger, he was obsessed with Blue Bottle. And we went to compete at Stanford. And he would not shut up. He's like, I'm going to go to Blue Bottle, Blue Bottle. It's the best coffee. So I was like, I'm going to try this just because I want to prove him wrong. Like, yeah. I want to prove to him that this is not as good as he says it is. So I go there. I pay an exorbitant amount for this coffee. I think I got like a Cafe Ole or something. I sit or like I go, I'm like about to walk out and I take a sip and I literally had to sit down because it was so good. And I just wanted to enjoy it. See, like I wanted I mean. to like savor it. That's what Ugh. I mean. Like blue bottle is just so good that like every time I take a sip, it like brings me so much like dopamine, like rushes to my body. I think. Oh yeah. That mm-hmm. like I have to spend it. It's six. It's six fifty in the store. The cold brew that I get. So it's like seven fifty is not that much to draw dash it. But yeah. a lot of the time I do just walk to the store in downtown San Diego. But like like you said, I have to literally like sit down and enjoy it because it's just that good. So yeah, it's the kind of thing you got to appreciate. If you're paying that much for coffee, you better appreciate every damn drop. That's what I mean. I I just have to budget into my expenses. So (laughs) yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. A few more questions. So a lot of people were asking about the Rose and the police officer story. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. This is actually a long, so this is the funny thing. So after like with all of these weird stories that happened to me a lot of people on let's run are just like oh my god she has to be lying this can't be real honestly there is just like i don't know what it is the weirdest shit happens to me like <laughs> all the time no literally and same. i don't know i don't know why so it's like i swear to god these are all straight up true i have the screenshots to record it but this actually happened um right before the olympic trials uh, because I had been in Flagstaff and I was driving to stay with family, friends in Boulder for the last week before trials. And I timed it wrong. So I am driving across New Mexico, like rural middle of nowhere, New Mexico, middle of the night. Um, it was right in like, right after Valentine's day, I'm hauling maybe like a bit over 90 or something. So not crazy fast, but like enough over the speed limit that it's, yeah, it's going to be a problem if I get pulled over. <laughs> I see the police officer as I'm blowing through. I'm the only oh, car man. on the road, blow past him. And I immediately know I'm like, shit, like <laughs> yeah, he got me. Lights go up. I immediately pull over. Um, and so he comes up to the car. He's like, do you know how fast you're going? I was like, I'm so sorry, sir. Like I, I'm trying to get to Colorado. Like I just, I, I let my mind drift. I didn't realize how fast I was going. He's just like, okay, well, because you were going, over 50 miles an hour over the speed limit this technically counts as criminal speeding and so you're going to need to show up at traffic court tomorrow and I'm like oh my god like I don't know where I am I'm in New Mexico right now um and I need to get to Colorado like by the morning like is there any way I can do it online can I come back he's like no it has to be tomorrow um so probably I'll have to take you in and you're going to have to spend the night in jail and I'm like (sighs) starting to panic I am starting to panic and I'm trying, I'm like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Like, it's going to be fine. I'm trying to explain. I'm like, sorry, like I, I can't spend the night in jail. I'm supposed to be running the Olympic trials. Like I'm going to be leaving out of, out of Denver. Like I need to get to Colorado. Is there any possibility? He's like, no, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm going to just have to take you in to jail right now. And so now I'm about to start crying. How are you <laughs> not, bro? I'd be in tears On the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, Mexico at like 2 a.m. And then just goes 
completely flips, goes, I'm just messing with you. I'm just letting you off with a warning. It's fine. And so now I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, like already. And then the kicker, he goes, happy Valentine's Day, ma'am. Pulls out a live goddamn rose from I don't know where and hands it to me and just says, have a nice night and walks away. And I'm like, what just happened? Like, like, wait, what? It was like such a range of emotions. I'm like, did I hallucinate this? Like, I, this is an actual rose. It's not like a plastic one. It's a real one. So did he have a bouquet of roses in the car? Did he bring this with him when he walked over to the window? Is he a real police officer? Yeah. I was so confused. And so I'm like, I got in, like, I kept just driving all night. And I text both Izzy, my sister, and John afterwards. I was just like, I just need to process <laughs> what just happened because this was legitimately insane. And so that's the thing is like, shit like that happens to me all the time. And I don't know why. <laughs> I would have been like a piss, honestly, after that, because like, if you're about to cry and you're like feeling that emotion for then it to be like a joke of like, you're about to go to jail. And like, that's like, honestly a risky like joke for the cop to do. Like, you don't know what this person's also, mental I'm, sanity that's is. I'm wondering if he was a real cop. I mean, that, that sounds like fake, just, but then I don't, it was like, it just, it was such an odd experience that I was just like, I just don't like, I feel like for feminism I should be mad <laughs> but also I didn't need to go to jail yeah so obviously then you're, I, then was you're like legi- I was legitimately criminal like criminal speeding like 90 in a 70 would have been not a not a good day so I'm just like so I feel like I shouldn't be mad yeah it's I don't like know mixed it emotions. was so wild a lot of mixed emotions still something that two years out from it I still do not fully understand that is so funny I feel like there are people in this world where weird things happen to them like that a lot and yeah and I also feel like I'm one of them I feel like I always just have weird stories my friends tell me this all the time they're like this is like literally only something that would happen to you and I was like yeah I don't know why I don't know why weird things happen to me as well but that's I would be traumatized from that I think a little bit I would be yeah. crying after leaving that because of the mix of emotions I would feel but yeah it was part of it it was just so late at night I was just like Huh. And then I woke up and I was like, maybe I dreamed that. Yeah, I was like, real? the rose was still there. I'm just like, well, no. Have you ever had anything like weird happen to you at a race or anything? Oh, I've had a lot of weird things happen to me <laughs> at races. Please specify. I can tell. See, that's the thing. This podcast is going to go like two hours because I've got a million weird stories. <laughs> I know. Um, okay. Well, like, if, is there anyone that sticks out in your head? I mean, everyone has like, there are people asking for poop stories, but honestly, like, I just don't, I don't love poop stories. They're just, everyone has a poop story, you know? So is there anything? No, that's not even weird. That's like normal. normal. Like, <laughs> that's let's a normal go, like, sport. Yeah, no, we got to go like full boat weird. Um, like, has anyone I'm done anything to... weird or anything? I mean, people do weird stuff all the time. That's just like par for the course at this point. I know. I'm trying um, to be more specific for this person. But um, I mean, I guess do you want like a, like a Molly is a shit show story. Do you want a like ridiculous things that we've tried at races I've i kind of want molly is a shit on. show molly's a shit, molly's show, a shit show so um my my first year as a pro i raced edinburgh um the edinburgh cross and i was running the day before on my shakeout and how edinburgh is laid out where we are racing is like at the bottom and like the palace grounds and then we were staying up like up the royal mile and so you descend this hill, like pretty steep hill. So I'm doing the shakeout the day before. And this little kid with his mom actually darted in front of me. And so, because I didn't want to wham sauce this kid straight onto the ground, I kind of grabbed him, but then his momentum going sideways, we fell. And so I'm like grabbing this kid and I go sideways straight into a concrete barrier, break two ribs. <gasps> yeah so that's the thing is I actually break ribs all the time like the New York thing wasn't like a one-off and so when people are like oh she's lying about the ribs I'm just like sir I break these all the time <laughs> um so yeah I actually broke two ribs the day before the race so I get back and like the the team docs are just like oh this is so not good oh my god that's but so they weren't- awkward <laughs> they weren't displaced or anything. So we just like slathered on like more Volterin and like Bengay than I've ever used in my life, wrapped it all up. And they're like, well, you won't puncture a lung or anything. You won't damage anything. So it's just like, 
it's just the amount of pain that you can bear in this race. So yeah, I just went out like totally psychopathed it of just like grit your teeth. Um, and yeah, did the race the next day, but yeah, it, that was nightmarish. So yeah, I've got experience running on broken ribs. It's just like, I broke like five when I was in high school ski racing. Um, I broke my collarbone, like that's the thing. Like, I'm just, a me- I'm really accident prone too. Like, are you just like clumsy so, you think, or what? Not even, uh, not even clumsy. Cause like ski racing in high school, it was like a crash that happened. Actually, no, I am pretty clumsy. So yeah, that too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's not like out of the norm for things like that to happen. Like heck, I even, I kind of displaced one in the Boston build, um, because I was leaning over the backseat of my car and like, press too hard and like the metal thing right there it like dislocated one of them so it's just like I'm just like constant mess oh my gosh okay it's people like you I would always say this in college when I was running with my teammates it's people like you where I want to go into your body for one day just to feel what your pain tolerance is like there's people on my team where I would be like I want to like just in the middle of a race like jump into their body and see what they're feeling actually I don't think I want to for you because it I your pain tolerance is probably so high that I will never want to experience that in my life So that's the thing. John has learned now from coaching me for two and a half years. Like if I tell him something hurts, that's like danger zone of like, stop. Don't even walk. I'm not, I'm not telling him it hurts until I am like physically incapacitated. And like, I also, I ran on a broken hip for a year. So it's like, he uses that as my pain threshold. Maybe that's it. Like my one secret talent is my one, my one talent is running crazy mileage. The other is just like being a psychopath with being able to handle pain. Though I will say Emily Infeld has the highest pain tolerance of any human I have ever met. It's scary. How do you know that? Uh, because we go to the same physical therapist. So one, she's had a ton of injuries and she can, she runs through everything. Yeah. Um, two, we go to the same physical therapist, John Ball or a uh, chiropractor mm-hmm. in Phoenix, legendary chiropractor. It is the most painful work you have ever done. Like JB makes people cry regularly. I know I've heard, I've heard through the grapevine. It It works, but it, it, it works, but it is legendarily painful. Like I really struggle with it. And I've got a pretty high pain tolerance. I was talking with JB one time and he's just like the only person like who actually like really impresses me is like Emily Enfeld. He's like, she has never shown any lick of pain he's like it honestly weirds me out a little bit like (laughs) so when you can impress John Ball with your pain tolerance like you are hard as nails and Emily Enfeld is hard as nails I have a new respect for Emily now I mean I already did respect her but now just knowing that yeah she is that's been probably like one of the most fun things of just like her kind of like joining our training group and like having John as her coach and coming out here to flag is just like, she is legitimately one of the most impressive people I've ever met. Like I fangirl, I've been fangirling over her since I was in high school. I met her on my recruiting trip to Georgetown. I was just like, Oh my God, Emily Ehrenfeld. But, um, <laughs> she's just incredible. She's so cool. She's so fun. She's the hardest freaking worker. Like I'm yeah. Love that woman. Do you have any other people like in the running world that you look up to at all? Oh my God. I look up to so many freaking people. I feel like there's just a lot of just like legitimately really cool, really hardworking people in this sport. Um, Rachel Smith Schneider, uh, is like one of my really close friends. Uh, she let me like live in her spare room when I was getting ready for the trial. I've known her since 2016, just another person who works so freaking hard and like, and is just the nicest all around person that you would ever meet. Um, Tara Hall is just absolute like psychopath on the track and the roads and then just like nicest human you'd ever meet I don't know there's just like I feel like there's a million people that I could just talk about it's like all these people that like you see like competing and then you meet them and you're just like oh my god you're even way cooler than I assumed (laughs) yeah and the running world is so small and I feel like everyone everyone has something to offer everyone brings something to the table regardless of whatever times that they run I feel like everyone has like a cool story so yeah that's what I love about like the elite running world is it is really small so everyone kind of knows each other but every time Mm -hmm. I meet someone everyone's like very cool so yeah okay one of the last questions I have is what is your Duncan order and also Duncan is so overrated I'm sorry okay so that's the thing is I have very I don't think Duncan hot coffee is good um sorry Duncan it's trash um, they're cold. <laughs> there really goes your like sponsorship. I know it's okay. They weren't going to sponsor me anyway. Um, 
but yeah, I, I'm not a big, like, like tons of add-ins. I like just straight up. And I do think their cold brew is well-made. I think it's like better than Starbucks. <gasps> so like for fast casual, I know, I know. I'm but that's, I know. See, that's the thing. I get Starbucks cold brew all the time though. I'm, I'm Starbucks cold brew is just so good. It is real good. Like anybody who tries to criticize Starbucks cold brew, like, no, come on. It's popular for a reason. Yeah. Um, but so my go-to order is usually cold brew, light ice, splash of coconut milk. Um, I just, I want to feel a little tropical, yeah. um, <laughs> but you no, know, I, I think it's, that's like, oh, it's just so good. Hits different after like a hot run. I always want coffee right after runs too. I don't know why my go-to Starbucks order though is blonde Americano. So I only like their blonde espresso, blonde okay. Americano, splash of coconut milk. Okay. Yeah, I haven't had coconut hot. milk in a minute, and I but I also don't really like hot coffee. I really only drink cold brew, so that's why I oh, love really? Blue Bottle and Phil's because I just get the ice drinks, the ice pour overs, yeah. and yeah. But um, I I, I, I like a good flat white, a good americano. Yeah, like, I just don't like hot coffee. Makes me sweat. I don't know. I think I'm just like warm blooded, but I do like flat whites. Those are really good. Probably mm. aren't they like made with like half and half or something? Like I don't know. Probably just because it's really creamy. No, too. it's just a different way of doing the the steamed milk. It's micro oh. foam. Uh, so yeah, it's just a little bit stiffer of stiffer of milk on there. It's kind of more like a cafe au lait. That or okay. cortados are real good too. If you want like a like one to one like espresso milk, shit's rocket fuel. It's good. Okay. I'm gonna have to like branch out honestly with my coffee and yeah. I also You'll need- come, you're gonna come to flag. We'll hit up the different spots. We'll do different like try out okay. different coffee places. I like this. I like this vibe. And I'm going to hang out with all my friends there, including you, because everyone's there right now. And I have massive FOMO. Um, that sounds like a plan. And I need to hey, go to Duncan. I've got a spare room right now. Girl, you got a place. I literally should. I'm about to book. Actually, I guess I could just drive there. Um, it's not that far away from San Diego. Um, okay. Well, I'm. this podcast is literally, I think it's my lo- longest podcast ever, but I mean, I, I'm having fun with it. It's, the questions are fun. I feel, I feel, see, uh, this whole time we were just like, we're not going to talk about running. Then we ended up talking about running the whole time. But. I know. I feel like I have to give people a little context, you know, just. Is there, people- is there any question on there that's just like absolutely out of left field? Oh, gosh. Okay. I need to like look through the list. I mean, one of, one of the ones like, that I have here. Up with like, oh, totally random one. I mean, people were asking about your favorite baked potato topping. Like, is that a common thing in Wisconsin? Like, do people eat baked potatoes? Like cheese? Yeah, like, I, I love a good, I love a baked potato, but like, I feel like it's boring. Like I usually just go like straight potato, butter, salt. Like, yeah. I'm a purist. I don't know. But that's the thing is like, I like, I love like any form of potato. I think the potato is the ultimate food. And so I call like myself Emma, in so many ways. I call myself Emma the potato gal because I eat so mm-hmm. many potatoes and I can yeah. eat so this is why you need to come to Flagstaff. We'll just eat potatoes all the time. Eat potatoes and drink coffee. A fully potato based diet. <laughs> I'm on the potato diet now from here on out. I could yeah, live no. off potatoes only. Potatoes and coffee, like I could live off that for sure. Like the, the straight up variety of what you can eat with potatoes. Yeah, it, like fries, chips, baked potatoes sliced potatoes there's a million different potatoes out there throw sweet potatoes in the mix and now you've just got like a, the sheer plethora of and there's so many different kinds of potatoes diets. exactly i've been really on um what is it the are they murasaki ones or like <gasps> okinawan sweet potatoes oh Whoa, so those are so good and they're so slept on and no one knows what they are i feel like unless you're like in the niche potato community yeah, the unless you're a real potato diehard. Yeah, unless you're a potato gal, like the Murasaki sweet potatoes, if you bake them in the oven and then you put them in the fridge and then you eat them with like peanut butter on top later, like you can always reheat them too, but I like them cold. And I literally just eat it like in my hand with potato on it. I slather on peanut butter and I just eat it like an ice cream cone. And they're yeah. so good. Girl, have you, okay, so not to... I've always bring it around to air fryers, but get an air fryer. It will change your damn. Oh, I already, I have an air fryer. It's back there, right there. Okay. If you've got like, that's the thing is like, like, like any sort of potato in the air fryer is just next level. I think it brings out the true greatness of the potato. Yeah, exactly. You toss it in some olive oil, you roast it in there. So crispy, Mm -hmm. so easy to make too. I don't understand why people don't have air fryers because air fryer is literally like, I don't even turn on my oven anymore. Why would I need to? Why would oh, I need yeah. to heat up my entire house with my oven, you know, when I can just turn on my air fryer and it's already ready to go right away. And works like, like twice as fast. Yeah, exactly. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to find like a really like out of the blue question. I mean, people ask like weird questions, but I don't really want to ask those. I feel like I always go like long on the answers too. I, I can do some rapid fire if that, uh, I feel I like know. I just start like babbling at a certain point. No, I mean, I feel like everyone does. That's well, that's like the point is that you want, it's like good to babble, you know, that's what people like about this. I should have just x the whole running part of this and then just literally gone straight for these questions because these we're are- just going to make it a two part podcast. We'll, uh, we'll just be on this shit for like two hours. No, literally First half like- can be running second half can just be absolute nonsense. No, actually though, like I've had people had to come on two times because mm-hmm. I did one with this like girl who used to row for Yale and now she's like a TikTok and she runs for fun. And she's come on mm-hmm. multiple times because our first episode was so long that yeah. I was like, bro, I have to cut it off because we'll do a live show. You'll come to flag. We'll get some potato. We're going to fry up some air potatoes and we're going to eat our potatoes while we do a live show. It's going to be great. Okay, maybe we just do that. Honestly, that sounds fun. And I feel like people would love that. People were saying I need to do live shows. So maybe yeah. that's the move. I've got yeah, maybe I'll, I'll come I've to Flag Stuff in there. Now. Yeah, okay. Come to Flag. We've got the patio. It's going to be fun. Like, we can just hang out. What's the other one? that? Yeah, what is the, um, the Beer Mile podcast does live shows? And- yeah, they do. I don't yeah, like, I, yeah. I mean, my schedule's free. I don't know why I haven't been doing this. Girl, come. Okay, well- I'll just save the rest of the questions for then because I'm not going to keep you on for two hours and okay. I, people will probably want it, but we can, we can like, you know, this, this will, is a to be continued. Yeah. Keep them, keep them waiting. Keep them wanting more. That's <laughs> the, this whole podcast. Me coming on here was just a ploy to get Emma out to Flagstaff. <laughs> Literally. That's probably what Eric would say because he really wanted me to come probably just to fill that room in their house. But either way, um, yeah. Okay, is, well, he gonna make, is he going to charge you? Girl, you can stay for free with me. Come on. Well, yeah, I was going to have to pay $500 a month on top oh. of my like insane rent here in San Diego. That was like the, like, I already pay a ton of rent here. So I was like, I cannot pay $500 more on top of rent. Girl, bring me, bring me an occasional cold brew. And so I'll, I'll, just, I'll keep a fills in a blue bottle in my, in my little cooler. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like, yeah, I mean, you don't, I'm not even worth the blue bottle. You can do the cheap one for me. You can pick me up dunks, but like, yeah, that's, that's the thing. You got, you got a free room at my place. Just bring a bag of potatoes. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. Okay. I do have one last question that I ask yes. everyone. What is your advice to your younger self? Mm, my advice to my younger self, don't take yourself too seriously. That's at the end of the day. Advice. It's just running. <laughs> That is what I say all the time because everyone gets, I mean, it's so easy to get caught up in it. And especially like the running world is very small and it's so mm-hmm. easy to get caught up in it and like feel like the world is on your shoulders. But at the end yeah. of the day, it's just running. You're just moving your legs. Honestly, that motion. was like after Boston, I was in my little like shame spiral of just like, I just dropped out of the Boston marathon and whatnot and like was really mopey with it. And I was like, you know what? At the end of the day, percent of the world does not give a shit that I just like attempted to run from Hopkinton to Boston and didn't at the end of the day that's all that it is and so it's like yeah check the ego a little bit like nobody cares it's fine (laughs) you're doing it because you love it and it's all about the journey so I do it because I love it exactly and occasionally to get free stuff sent to me in the mail yeah (laughs) (laughs) um okay well Again, I'm sure people already follow you, but if they if they don't, where can they check you out? I also saw that you have a YouTube channel now. I do have a YouTube now. Um, I do not run it. I like Justin and Colin are fully running that. I just talk and You're they just somehow make it. They make it make sense. Um, so I very much appreciate that. So yeah, you can follow me on Instagram um, at by golly Molly. Um, it's just 90% hot nonsense on there. Um, and then YouTube channel, we actually will be having a Boston recap one come out pretty soon here. Um, but yeah, now it's, I feel like those are the two, the two main ones. I don't TikTok. No renegade dance for you on there. I, I can't, I can't. Eh. Oh yeah. <laughs> Get it. Um, yeah, I know this is an audio podcast. You'll, you'll see it on the live show. How cringy my dance. Okay? <laughs> yeah. No one even got to see that. That was just for my own viewing pleasure, but I, I hit the whoa badly. No, it was great. Well, thank you again for taking extra time now to come on this podcast. It was very fun. We have much more to be discussed. <laughs> okay. Usually we end the podcast with a peace out fellas, but Molly's phone died like right at the end, literally with the last three words of the episode. So 
I'm sorry that we could not end it on that note. But that being said, we'll have to do a live in-person show so we answer way more of your guys' questions because that episode was really fun. It was just going too long. So I had to cut it off somewhere. I didn't want to take her entire day away from her. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts if you love the episodes. Share with your friends, your family, your favorite fellas. Listen to some more episodes. I feel like I've had almost every single professional runner or just runner in general on this podcast. So if you type in on Apple Podcasts, comments over cold brew and your favorite runner's name, they probably come up. So there you guys go. I will catch you all next week. Peace out, fellas.